Howdy, hello, and welcome. Deer Talk Now is coming at you live again. I am Dan Schmidt from Deer and Deer Hunting. Thank you for joining us once again. This is the Deer Talk Now podcast. I don't know how many we have done, but we are ripping through them this year. And this episode coming at you solo again, what I want to do here with today's podcast is bring it back to, if you guys remember, if whoever remembers or whoever listened to the podcast or watched them when we started these in 2012, 10 years ago, if you can believe that, um, we used to take your questions. Any question you have, we will answer. And that's what I'm here for. I've been here for almost 30 years. I've absorbed a lot of whitetail wisdom. I always say this isn't my whitetail wisdom. It's stuff I've absorbed. And I would suggest you do it as well, especially if you're a newcomer to this whole deer and deer hunting gig, game, uh, activity, lifestyle. Always listen to your elders, absorb what they have to say, and don't dismiss it as, oh, that's just some old codger telling me some stories that are no longer relevant or wisdom. Those guys and gals who were there before us knew what they were doing, and that's Uh, The basis of today's information is going to be on scientific research that was conducted in America. My goodness, it dates back longer than I've been alive, and I'm not going to tell you how long I've been alive. It's been a while. Um, So today's questions I got from several um, uh, deer and deer hunting fans across social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, even actually just some man on the street kind of stuff that it's the same stuff that I hear year after year after year. And it revolves around whitetail fawns, mostly. And the big thing here that my response is I give the the information. But then the other thing is I urge people, reading is obviously a wonderful habit, But some of the stuff, if you can get your hands on and you can do it pretty readily now with the internet and even eBooks and just a simple Google search, but uh, two people that are integral in the wisdom that I have on deer would be Eldo Leopold, the great Eldo Leopold and John Ozoga uh, from the Minnesota, I'm sorry, (laughs) my goodness, forgive me there, John, the Michigan DNR that was formerly the Michigan DNR. John worked at the Cousineau Wildlife Research Center for over 30 years with um, Lou Verm, and those guys conducted some of the best research ever conducted on whitetails. So th- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw from that. I'm going to back my way into this saying that if you haven't uh, subscribed or liked wherever you're listening to this podcast, please do, please do so. It's free no matter where you're listening to it. The, the platforms are listed on our webpage, deerandeerhunting.com. Just click on the Deer Talk Now um, page, and it's going to show you all the platforms. Every podcast platform, I'm not going to name them all, they're there. So if you listen to this, you can download them there. If you want to watch them, you can watch them on our YouTube channel, Facebook, or right there on the website. So be- let's get into it. I'm going to take a sip here of water, and then we're going to get to the first question. This is going to be a rather short um, podcast today because I'm going to start with two basic questions and then give you everything I know in sidebars around them. So one second here. All right, here we go. The first question was very common this time of year. um, At what age can a a fawn survive on its own? Very common question, and we see it a lot, especially in the summer months, um, we start probably, I would say, hearing this question in June, July, and August every year, and even into hunting season when we get to September and October. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. So let's first talk about fawns. Um, so f- for you might be listening to this in Florida or Alabama or Georgia or Texas, or you could be up north in Maine or Minnesota or you know Wyoming or Montana, wherever you're at. This isn't a blan- this isn't blanket information, so you have to tweak it um, to your region. But for the most part, the the um, ages I'm going to give you here would apply to across middle of America. So most of the Midwest, most of the North, 
some of the South, depending upon where you're at. So if you're in Kentucky, yes. If you're in Tennessee, yes. But if you get farther South and you're living farther South, you obviously know, or if you don't, you should ask somebody local to you what the fawning dates are, because that's the thing you should understand. But if we're living uh, here in the Midwest, the average fawning uh, dates, the preponderance of the fawns born here are born between May 19th and June 10th. That's um, that's through scientific research that we know that. Most of the fawns are born in the, that span of, what are we looking at, uh, three weeks. May, we're just going to say May 20th to June 10th. So the interesting thing that I find about this is that uh, the short answer here, 10 weeks. That's it. 10 weeks, a fawn is essentially weaned. So if you back those dates out, you're looking at a fawn for the most part in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, in the North, is going to be weaned by July 28th to August 19th. That's through scientific research. I'm not making that up. Those That was um, peer, peer-reviewed, published um, research that most fawns are weaned physiologically by August 20th. So that should give you a little bit of idea there um, okay, so you see a doe that's hit on the road now in June or early July. Will that fawn survive? Probably not. Um, it, it hasn't been weaned yet. It's probably not going to survive. Is it automatically going to survive on August 20th? Because that's the date I gave you that when most of them are weaned? No, um, not necessarily. There's a lot of factors at play there. But the thing you should keep in mind is that wild animals are programmed to survive. And that's why, you know, certain animals have certain amounts of their litter. Some might have more because more are going to perish, like rabbits. You know, rabbits, they have 10, sometimes more in a litter. Are all 10 of them going to survive? No, there's predators, there's other things, there's heat, there's abandonment, there's all sorts of things. And that does um, come into play with whitetails but the thing that I find with people um, unknowingly believe that a fawn needs much longer than that to be weaned. It does not. And the other thing that I see is once we get to hunting seasons, if you look at hunting season, bow hunting seasons particularly, um, Wyoming is September 1st. Uh, there's some other ones that are like ours is always the third Saturday in September. I believe it's, uh, I think ours is... September 18th this year. Those are set off of weaning dates. Th- those archery seasons, the hunting seasons, when they were first enacted, they were enacted by biologists who already knew this information. So they're putting that, they kind of erred on the side of caution and they said, okay, we're going to make it a month past normal uh, we- weaning times. So if the normal weaning time, uh, let's just say, you know, 66% of these fawns are weaned by August 20th. We're going to make that a month later just to be, just to cover our bases. But I will hear every year, I can set my watch by it. Every year, guys and gals will text me or I'll see posts on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. And people will say, you know, I'm up in my bow stand and look at that. You know, those, these two fawns are they're suckling on their mother right now. I can't shoot that doe. That those fawns aren't going to survive. Nonsense. Those fawns are going to survive. That is just an instinct. There. Yes, you will shoot a doe early season, and there will be milk in that udder. Yes, there will be. It takes a while for that doe to um, wean itself, obviously, um, to wean those to wean those fawns. That milk is not integral to that fawn survival. It's there. There's another factor here with fawns that. Just because it's weaned doesn't mean it's going to survive because it, you know, it's a functioning ruminant. It's a functioning ruminant and it's out there. It can survive. Does it mean it's going to survive? Well, no, there's a lot of other things at play. There's predators and that's what we're going to get to next. There's predators, there's weather, there's cover, there's all sorts of things that play into it. Um, How should you use that information? Number one, understand that the Lord works in mysterious ways and what you see out there is not Disney. You know, um, you get to bow season, you, you have a doe come in with two fawns. 
Should you shoot the doe? Do you want to shoot the doe? Do you have a tag? Do you need the meat? Or do you want to wait? If you have a tag and you need the meat, shoot the doe. There's nothing wrong with it. Can your, can your land survive to have a doe taken off of it? I would say in 100% of the areas, yes, you can. You can take one off, so take it off. There's nothing wrong with that. And in a lot of cases, what I always promote, in especially areas with high deer populations, shoot that doe right away. Because that adult doe, again, high populations, that adult doe is going to be the one you're going to want to take off because obviously it's a productive one. Does that cure anything? No, it does not. It's got, and this is another topic I'm going to get into. It's got to be a prolonged effort if you are in an area that needs heavy doe harvests. It's not just I shot a doe and I feel great about myself because I'm helping management. That's that's one drop in the ocean. So, like I said, there's many prongs to this conversation. Man. Hey, there's that sound again. We know what that all means. It means we're going to thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point and the all-new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. With speeds of up to 505 feet per second and 227 foot-pounds of blistering power, the Nitro 505 is the fastest crossbow on the market and the most powerful crossbow ever built by 10 Point. I have not shot this crossbow yet. I am going to later this year, but my buddy Brad Fenson has. You might have already seen the videos on our YouTube page and other places on deer and deer hunting. Brad is reporting that this crossbow has a perfect balance of reverse draw power in a platform that is unmatched in its ability to produce speed and power. The Nitro 505 is equipped with the newly designed RX-8 cam system, a two-stage zero creep S1 trigger, that delivers a consistent, crisp three and a half pound pull and the easy cocking and decocking systems that dealers recommend most, the AccuSlide. Check them out today at a 10 point dealer near you or go online for more information at 10pointcrossbows.com. So along those same lines, okay, that's why we have early archery seasons. Um, what about late born fawns? And this is very interesting. Um, and this is where that research that Ozoga and Verm did uh, at the Cousineau Research Center, it was a square mile enclosure, square mile, 640 acres, um, where some of the best, if not the best, most insightful deer research took place. And that was from the uh, late 50s, early 60s, all the way into the 1990s. Um, that place in Michigan set the bar for all these other places across the country. And, and I'm talking that that's including Auburn, which has a, just a fabulous deer research program down there. It's including Mississippi. It's including some of these other states, p- places in Texas um, <clears throat> that have wonderful deer research facilities. And they're learning lots of insights, even in addition to what we knew then. But th- that's what we knew um from that research these guys did some some of it 30 40 years ago was late born fawns is very interesting here in the midwest i'm talking about a fawn that you're going to see a brand new baby fawn in july or august um it happens and some people think oh my goodness you know that is late some there's been reports even later than that well that fawn was just born you know in you know mid july or early august that thing can't survive Again, nature is amazing. It's amazing. What they have found through research, most of these late-born fawns, it's usually a first-time mother. Um, so you're looking at a yearling doe. A lot of these yearling does will give birth to twins, and they, they give birth on time. They, and normally what happens there is you've got a very healthy uh, deer population. Those uh, yearling does are being bred on time. And then uh, they're actually as, as fawns. Now they're yearlings. First time they have two fawns, but they have them on normal timing. Late born fawns. What could that be attributed to? It could be attributed just to the fact that it was a small doe fawn last year and it got bred in December or later. Um, that's very possible. And what we know through research is that a doe fawn to breed has to re- reach a certain body weight to do that. 
So they might have not reached that body weight until later in the season, or they might have just not been bred. Um, or, you know, for whatever reason, and there, like I said, th there's reasons for the reasons, but they give birth late in July or August. A lot of times, and I don't want to say most of the time, but it, it could very well be in your area. If you're seeing a late born fawn, that fawn, a lot of times is a single litter mate. So it was born by itself, could be a buck fawn. Um, and it's normally bigger than um, a fawn, you know, that was born a month or a month and a half earlier. So like I said, that's just the, the mystery of the universe there in the fact that that, born, that fawn is behind the eight ball. Um, born late, but guess what? By that, if it is living on decent habitat, good cover, good food, low predators, it's going to survive that winter. And then that's, you know, like I said, you, I could go down many rabbit holes here, but that fawn, let's say it's a buck fawn. Let's say it's born late, but it's, it's big enough. It's body weight is big enough. It's mother had enough energy to put into raising or growing that fawn. Now the fawn is born, survives winter, and well, next year it's a yearling buck and it's got small antlers. And everybody says, "Oh, that's a cull buck." No, it's it's it was a it was a late born fawn. You're not going to know what that thing manifests for two or three or four years. So that's something to keep in mind. So don't automatically think, "Oh my gosh," you know, you're on your gun stand, you know, in November or December or whenever your gun season comes in, and you see this quote unquote runty little fawn come in. And then you just start making assumptions that, oh, man, you know, the habitat's poor and blah, blah, blah. No, no, there's reasons for it. Many, many reasons that you should be thinking that this thing isn't runty because of necessarily a, a deficiency somewhere. It just, that's what happened. And like I said, you're not going to know that individual animal. You're not going to know what it's going to be for quite a long time. Um Again, there's a, probably a lot of different things that could go on there. Uh, long story short there is you can't automatically assume that a fawn is orphaned if you if you just see it by itself, especially now in summer. The cover is so thick. There's so many different uh, variables at play that that thing could have been rousted out of its bed. The mother could have been spooked, whatever. It's going to come back. You know, the mother runs across the road with one and the other one gets freaked out and runs the other way. And now you think, oh, man, I disrupted it. No, you didn't. That was just a a, um, a blink of the day that you saw in front of you. One eye blink of the day that, you know, later the uh, that other fawn that got disoriented came back across. The mother went and got it, whatever. There's so many things. Nature takes care of itself. Um, also, nature is cruel. Um, doe is hit on the road. Will that fawn survive? Probably not. That stuff happens, you know, and, uh, and to go back to the, uh, rabbit, uh, scenario, yeah, you're out there mowing your grass and you come across a litter of baby rabbits and they're like this big and they're squirming around. Are they going to survive? Probably not. If the mother got killed, probably not. Um, but that's again, like I said, on the flip side, using the rabbit scenario, um, those things, wild rabbits are, uh, they're, they can be on their own within a couple weeks. It's, it's absolutely, I just find it absolutely fascinating. And you look at any other, look at, uh, robins, you know, they have their babies, they lay, they lay their eggs, they have their babies and those babies are like, they're sitting there with a wobbly head and, and all of a sudden they come out of this and boom, they're gone. And it doesn't take long. Nature is programmed that way. And white tails, are so intricate in the way they are programmed that they're going to survive, but not all of them are going to survive. And that brings me to the second question. I told you this was going to be short. We're not even going to run a half an hour today. Hang on one second. The second part of the question is, um, uh, we get this, I mean, we get this year round. Um, should I shoot blank to help the fawns? Okay, in, insert in that blank. Should I shoot coyotes? And actually, actually, that's probably the only thing I put can put in there, because um, black bears obviously need a tag. Wolves are protected in most states, but um, how much are those going to? You know, the the wolves are killing all my fawns. The black bears are killing all my fawns. The coyotes are killing all my fawns. Um, number one, they're not your fawns. They're nature's fawns, and they're our ubiquitous 
um, human community farms. Um, it's a natural resource. It's a resource for all of us. So don't claim ownership on it. Don't think that you're going to save the world by this. But um, this is another thing that John Ozoga told me probably, oh man, probably 25 years ago. I didn't understand. I was under the assumption that a lot of people are today that I should wage war on coyotes because they're going to kill all the fawns. And if I wage war on coyotes, um, I'm going to save the fawns and there's going to be more fawns. Well, this was his direct quote to me. Waging war on coyotes is a war you might not want to partake in. And what he meant by that is that it is so complicated that it, he's not saying don't k kill coyotes. But what he was telling me is don't partake into killing coyotes if you think you're going to make a difference in the in the uh, uh, whitetail population. Not that it's an all or nothing proposition, but what, what John was trying to educate me and he did and he can ed he educated all of us because his articles are uh, deer and deer hunting. Go to deer and deer hunting.com. We have a lot of them there. Uh, we've published so many of his articles in the magazine over the past, well, since 1994, actually before 1994. Um, and again, this was all scientifically based research, um, not just his insights, but research not only he conducted, but researchers con conducted across the country. Uh, if you look at any predator of whitetails, and I'm going to try to take them one by one here. Um, coyotes, bears, wolves, ma mainly, and then you have some other ones like bobcats and mountain lions and things like that, which are region specific. The biggest ones obviously would be coyotes, black bears, and, and timber wolves. So let's start with coyotes because that's the biggest one. The problem with, if you look at any of these predator species, they're opportunists, right? So if you have a high po coyote population, if you have a high black bear population, if you have a high timber wolf population, what is probably the overriding theme amongst all three of those scenarios? You probably have a high deer density, a deer population. Those things, are they eat other things. They eat mice and birds and whatever else they can get their teeth on. But for the most part, that white-tailed deer resource is driving those populations. And the problem that we have there in America is that, not for coyotes, but for um, black bears and wolves, is that there's limited things that we can do to keep those populations in check. Coyotes, we don't have that problem for the most part. Uh, for most states, um, it's open season, which it should be, because coyotes are so prolific that you you can't wipe them out. You, you simply can't. And then in some places, like in the southeast, in, in the southeastern part of the United States, uh, some states have taken another level, and they have bounty programs on coyotes, which is warranted. Is it working? In some small areas, it is. Over the large scale, it's probably not because not enough people are taking it serious enough or they simply don't have the time or resources to do that. But um, if you go out, uh, the, the thing is, is should I, if I shoot a coyote, will it save a fawn? In one instance, maybe over a region, no, it will not. Uh, just taking that like, hey, hey if I'm going to shoot this incidental coyote here or there, it's not going to make a difference. If you start ramping things up and you have really heavy coyote hunting presence somewhere, uh, either guys running dogs, uh, hounds for them, or, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of guys that get real serious about hunting coyotes in the wintertime. Um, and even trapping. Trapping is the most important thing. If you don't trap, enlist a trapper. And we have had a fracture in our community over the past probably 40 years, I would say, that, I mean, hunters and trappers get along, but I don't see the collaboration there that there should be. If you, especially if you are a landowner and a big landowner, or if you control a lot of acres uh, for a hunting lease or, you know, what, what have you, if you're managing for deer, 
if you don't trap intensively, go to the coffee shop, get in town, find a real deal trapper, coyote trapper, and give that guy free reign to your property during during trapping season. You, and it's got to be sustained. Um, the reason why I say that, an, another thing with uh, scientific research has shown us, if you don't do it right, here's what happens. If you just go out there kind of nonchalant, oh, we're going to try to shoot a couple coyotes this weekend, and you know we put up 12 of them this winter, hey, that's good. And people say, well, everyone counts, but does it? I, I rem remind them because here's what happens. Again, with nature, and again, I will bring God into this conversation because he's one who created it all. It is fascinating stuff. Those creatures are wired to survive every bit, if not more, than whitetails. And what happens here, a short, and I'm, I'm using that uh, relatively speaking, a short, intense coyote cull. So if you go out there and you, you do some a bunch of hunting and you do a bunch of trapping, let's say this winter, and you clap your hands and you say, man, we took out 100 of them. We did a good job. Guess what happens in spring? Biologically, those things are programmed that that female coyote is going to give birth to more pups. And it happens with coyotes. It happens with raccoons. So if you think you're trapping all these raccoons to save turkeys, if you're doing it during short bursts of intensity, the 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 animal is going to rebound or respond by saying they automatically are programmed to survive that way. So if you if you contrast it this way, let's say you have um, let's say you live in a state that isn't overrun with coyotes or an area. And you do have some coyote predation and you do, you know, you you do, you are noticing it. The difference there that you have to weigh is that an older age structure coyote population, yes, they're going to take out some animals, but that female might only be putting out two or three pups a year because biologically she is programmed that that's what that landscape can handle. And then when you fracture that society, now you have a society of much younger animals competing against each other for pecking order and competing for the resources. So you made your problem worse. And they have found this through many, many studies that people try, you know, they're trying to do a, a an admirable thing in their minds in that, oh, we got we to manage this coyote population. Of course, they have an ulterior motive that they want more game animals and deer is the big one, right? So they want to have more deer. And in fact, they made the problem worse because they went out there, they fractured that society of, um, I, I always call it society because I'm going to talk about it in deer in a second, of individuals. And now those individuals, it's chaos. It's basically you you went in, you took out you, you took out the alpha males and females, and now you got a bunch of youngsters, teenagers running around causing chaos. And that's what happens with cows. In deer, this is what happens with doe harvests. And that's why we still have a problem in a lot of areas. And we saw it here in my home state of Wisconsin big time over the past 12, it's more than 25 years, in the fact that the state tried to do the right thing. We were overprescribed. We had too many deer, 50, 60, 75 or more deer per square mile on the habitat when, in fact, it should have been more like 30. And so, like, we had two to three times more than we should have had. Gave out all these doe tags. Well, a lot of these areas where guys were like, I, we, you know, we don't kill the does, Junior. Nope, we don't do that. We only hunt the bucks. Well, when you went in and you and you go in and you just hammer that doe population, now you're killing all the four and five and even older six, in some cases, eight, nine, ten-year-old does that were sacred cows that weren't being killed. And over a couple of years, yes, we took out hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million antlerless deer off the landscape but now what you run into is situations where you've got deer populations where the matriarch might be a two and a half year old doe and the the you know the yearling does and the two and a half year old does are the ones who are are the mothers of all the the new crop 
And what happens with deer is I've talked about this many times on this program and, and deer and deer hunting TV on pursuit channel is that white tailed does live in concentric circles. So if you look at an overhead map of the landscape, if you've got, if it, there's a circle like reg areas across that area, the way I've always described it is, so how would you, and, and I hate to compare, I hate this when people do it cause I'm going to do it right now. But, um, when they compare deer to people, but this is the way I use it so people can visualize it. That's the only reason I'm going to use this example. If you went into a large, let's say you go into a city with, that was nothing but housing complexes and you went in and you took out all the adults, all the adult people, they say everybody 30 and over, you, you took them and you deported them somewhere. And now you've got the entire complex run by teenagers and young people in their twenties. No offense, Ian, <laughs> my producer's like in his twenties. Um, what you're going to have is you're going to have chaos because now you're going to have everybody who's run around. Like there's nobody in charge. Oh, I'm going to be in charge. And I, you know, and I'm the youngster and I don't have those life experiences. The same thing happens with deer. So when you have that with deer, it, it, it's, it becomes almost impossible. I don't want to say impossible, but it becomes extraordinarily difficult to manage that antlerless segment because now, in addition to how deer live on the landscape, now I am dealing with property ownership and property lines and people who own 10 acres or 20 acres or 500 acres, and they all have different views on how they, the, that deer herd should be managed. And guess what? The, the older deer in that um, scenario, the two and a half year olds, where are they going to live? They're going to live in the high rent areas, right? So they're going to live on the, the property, the best, the best edge cover with the best, with the best food, the best cover, water, you know, everything right there. And then all those other deer, <clears throat> like I said, you, I can set my watch to use an analogy again. Every year to go out in this property where I hunt, which is only 10 minutes from the office here, and on opening day of bow season, every single year, I can kill a yearling doe. I can fill that tag on a yearling doe. Why is that? Because it is a very, very marginally poor property. It's basically fallow. It abuts a bunch of state land, which is horrible. It's old growth. Not much there for a deer to eat, much less cover. So that's where that deer got pushed out. The same thing happens. I'm bringing this back. I know that was a long analogy. I'm bringing this back to coyotes. The same thing happens with coyotes if it's a short, intense hunt like that. What the, what's the result going to be? You're going to have um, coyotes, mothers, kicking out huge litters next year and a year after that. So what's the answer? The answer is sustained predator management in areas that have predator problems. But that's only, that's, that's not even first on the list. First on the list is managing your land for quality cover and quality food. Does that mean putting up a little pithy, no offense to anybody, a quarter acre food plot? And it's like, I'm giving them food. You know, one of my best examples, sorry, another sidebar here. So we, we had a property here that we hunted on the television show probably, well, I don't know, it was almost 20 years ago. And we went up there and it was really poor property. It was pr really poor land. It was former public land that was timber company land. So I'm talking, you know, saw log oaks and maples, beautiful trees, zero understory because it had been public land and it hadn't been man managed for deer cover. And the deer, had j the deer that were there basically ate every all the understory out of there. And <clears throat> they brought in some bulldozers and made a couple of food plots that might have been like, I don't even think you could measure them in acres. They are kill plots. Let's be honest. It was probably, you know, 50 yards wide by 100 yards wide. And I went, I went there to give my assessment, and these guys were all proud as peacocks and saying, "Well, what do you think?" And I'm like, "Well, that's that's a nice Snickers bar for about a week for these deer." And they went, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "That is not providing year-round nutrition. There's nothing you could really do in that situation to provide year-round nutrition. The only thing you can do." In a situation like that is if you have really fallow land, like the other property I talked about, um, 
or, you know, old growth forests, if it's yours and you want to manage it for deer, enlist the help of a forester. Don't try to do it yourself. Enlist the help of a forester and have them tell you a prescription of what is going to make this forest the healthiest forest. Because the other problem that we run into now is that in areas with high deer densities, even if you want to do that, if you want to do the right thing, you want to manage a forest for better deer cover and food. Cover's got to be number one. Food's got to be number two. Um, sometimes if you go in there and you do really heavy harvesting, like clear cutting and whatnot, that's going to come back as a brand new forest. It's going to be something else. And chances are uh, most of that understory is not even going to be anything edible for deer. It's going to be all um, invasive species in a lot's a lot of parts of the country. Here we're talking about, you know, th th you're going to get sumac, you're going to get Japanese barberry, you're going to get bush honeysuckle, you're going to get stuff they're probably not going to eat. Uh, it's going to look good. And this goes back to Leopold. You know, Leopold's days, the hunters hated him because they said, look, there's all sorts of brush. You know, there's all sorts of brush for the deer. Yeah, but it's not preferred species. You got to manage for preferred species. Okay, I'm going to digress there a little bit. Um, so the first thing, manage your land for deer density. Bring that deer density down as best as you can. Um, you're not going to be able to do it on a region-wide, but lobby for better region management. And by better region management, it's not necessary. Well, it's not deer numbers as far as hi higher deer numbers. It's the thing you should be lobbying for is better cover and food quality for your forests. So if you, if you have cover, um, if you if you have quality, you're going to have food. And if you have cover, you're going to have more places for those fawns to hide in summer. Uh, summer habitat is important for fawns. Over winter habitat is the most important thing for does. Because if they don't have the overwinter habitat, they're not going to come through winter in a, uh, a, a healthy enough state to give you the production that you want. So... Uh, the other thing that I should probably throw in here, because I know I'm throwing a lot at you, is as guys, most of us, okay, 98%, we know that through the demographics, 98% of you watching this are guys. And this is no offense to the women because this is actually a dig on the guys, myself included. As guys, we want to be fixers, whether that's a relationship or whether that's hunting. We, we, if, if you, we don't want to hear about problems. We want to, if there is a problem, we want to fix it. Some of the stuff you can't fix. Some of the stuff you use, you can do your best, lobby for the rest. Hey, that's, that rhymes. Do your best, lobby for the rest, and hope, you know, things will improve. And they should improve. If you're doing your best on deer habitat and you're lobbying for better management of the habitat around you, working with your neighbors, um, those things are going to help. One couple other things I wanted to add in here because I know I mentioned them. So sustained trapping and year-round management of coyotes. That's how I try to try to manage raccoons and possums and everything else that's eating turkey eggs is a, a sustained, and most states have uh, now are allowing this, year-round trapping and shooting of raccoons because it is a problem. So if you want to have better uh, small game populations, we're not trying to eradicate them. We're trying to just keep that level down. And the problem that we've had in America is that we've gone more to an urban uh, existence. Uh, back, you go back to the 1950s, everybody trapped. They were trapping for extra income. They were trapping to eat coons and stuff like that. Everybody did it. So the, the there was a, a perfect storm there, a good storm, in the fact that it was, you know, better habitat. There was a lot of brushy ro uh, hedgerows in farm country, a lot more places for rabbits and squirrels and pheasants and grouse and, you know, everything else to survive. Turkeys came along after that when we got the nice populations. But um, manage for that. And then if you're living in an area, that's my final uh, uh, thought here, with wolves or bears, a uh, quick pop question for you is, out of these three species, which kills the most fawns? Okay. Um, I'm going to list them right now for you. A coyote, a black bear, 
let me rephrase this. Out of the following three species, which one is most efficient on killing whitetail fawns? Black bear, timber wolf, or eastern coyote? Think about that for two seconds. You've already shouted the answer at your screen, hopefully. If you said coyote or timber wolf, you're wrong. According to research, black bear is the most efficient predator on young whitetail fawns. And I should have prefaced it that way, on young whitetail fawns. Within those first couple weeks of life, there have been studies that have shown that a black bear population can take out 50 to 80% of that new fawn crop. Isn't that amazing? They are extraordinarily lethal predators. Black bears are. And you see this mostly in the north, obviously, where the black bear populations are. But there's some states like Florida now. Their black bear populations out of control and nobody can do anything about it because you can't hunt them there, which is an absolute shame because there's a research resource there that is wreaking havoc on the ecosystem, not just fawns, everything else, and they're not managing it because it's a political topic. Um, we are managing it in other places, but we still have problems. Like here in the upper Midwest, we have a lot of black bears, but those bears are starting to move farther south now because there's more deer down there, and that's a problem. But let's get to the other two. Um, timber wolves, yes, they kill fawns. Yes, they're they're efficient. But um, for the most part, before you get to winter, about 25%. And like if you get to, you know, in a bad area where you got both wolves and uh, bears and coyotes, you might lose 50% automatically. 50% of your fawns might be gone automatically. So that's tough. And that's how you got to decide on how you're going to manage your deer population, how many does you're going to kill. And you really need to think about it in areas where the populations aren't out of control because the talking points now from the states mostly is, well, deer population's out of control everywhere, and it's not. So that's where I've always said there's some places where you got to say, hey, we gotta we got to rein back on our doe harvests. We can't be going out and filling all 10 of these tags that the state gives just because they gave them to us. You got to look at your property, understand how big your property is, understand what the deer population is in the region around you and approach it that way. And coyotes, the only thing I'm going to say there is I don't want to dismiss shooting a coyote when you see it. If the opportunity is there and you have the opportunity, you want to take the opportunity, absolutely take that opportunity, but don't fool yourself into thinking that you're making a huge difference. You might make a small difference, but if you want to make a big difference, and that is a goal of yours, which I would argue should be for anybody who's, especially who's managing a larger property, you have to get more serious and think in long-term efforts in not only hunting. Hunting rarely should be the lower um, uh, option. I mean, yes, do it, but that's just kind of like gravy trapping sustained trapping and year-round management efforts no different than me trying to kill all the mice and rats in my barn to help prevent my chickens from getting sick and have them eating the food i i have to have traps out year-round for that and in some areas coyotes no different sustained prolonged efforts over years of time will help but the second you take your foot off that gas pedal you're back to the ocean. <laughs> like I said, you're, you're back to taking um, cupfuls of water out of the ocean because it's 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 going to catch up with you. I hope this helped um, shed some light. Again, not my, this isn't my wisdom. This is stuff I've gleaned uh, from working here for almost 28 years, dealing with the best research in the country, uh, the researchers. It's scientific, peer-reviewed peer research on how things work and Again, a tip of my hat and a shout out to all those who came before us. You know, Aldo Leopold was right there in the beginning. And he has been romanticized past the point of being a, uh, a, a highly intelligent and wise wildlife manager. And the fact that now he's kind of embraced by the tree hugging community is like, no, he didn't want to kill these. Yes, he did. He, he was trying to educate people on how this stuff worked. 
this is how wolves work in conjunction with, you know, other population, animal population. Th this is how black bears uh, affect our populations. These are the different things that affect our populations, and it all comes down to cover. It all comes down to the ecosystem of the woods and the trees and the brush and the, you know, the other things that are growing around that deer ha have to have to live. So again, I hope that helped. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. Just click the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this podcast or watching it. And until next week, thank you for joining us. And I will catch you again for another episode of Deer Talk Now. This episode is brought to you by Drop Tine Spirits and their premium 12-point bourbon whiskey. The story of Drop Tine's finest bourbon starts with being double barrel aged. What this means is they first aged the bourbon in new charred oak barrels in America's heartland, then sent it to California to be finished in the salt air of the Pacific in the finest brandy barrels. Finishing their bourbon in brandy barrels was the choice of many trials to find flavors as unique as the Drop Tine deer. They wanted a bourbon that is not only warm to the palate, but it would sip smoothly and leave notes of fruit behind. They found the perfect brandy barrels in the Russian River Valley near Sonoma, California, and what they created is a bourbon whiskey that exhibits a sweet, floral, almost honey-like aroma balanced by caramel, toasted wood, brown sugar, and toffee. 12-point bourbon is only available online. To get a taste for yourself after the hunt, visit droptime.com. Deer Talk Now is also brought to you by HuntStand and the new HuntStand Pro app. Let me tell you, I've been using the HuntStand app for a couple seasons now, and I can honestly say it has changed the way I hunt. There's no more guessing on wind direction, property lines, and stand locations. The app takes my hunting to precise new levels that help me be more successful. The new HuntStand Pro app unlocks unlimited property data on a nationwide basis, including detailed property boundaries throughout the United States and most of Canada, including property owners' names in the United States with detailed ownership information. You can also access detailed public land maps and search for properties on a county, state, or province level. There are so many features that also help you dial in on the best spots based on weather conditions. For more information, visit the App Store or log on to HuntStand.com. This podcast is brought to you by Cuddyback Cameras. I'm going to tell you guys, I've known Mark Cuddyback personally for over 20 years, and I've been using those cameras for over 18 years on Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The recent technology in the past few years has absolutely blown me away. And for those of you who don't have great cell coverage where you hunt, Cuddyback's ability to daisy chain from one camera to another camera with new CuddyLink technology is an absolute lifesaver. With the ability to connect 24 cameras, I place one home base camera at the edge of my property, swap that card out just once a month, and I get a look at all the activity on my entire property. My deer stay unpressured and the conditions are prime for opening day of bow season. For those of you who have the luxury of cell service, check out their new Cuddyback Tracks technology. This is game changing. For more information, go to cuddyback.com. Deer Talk is also brought to you by Traditions Firearms, a family-owned business and inventor of the new Nitro Fire muzzleloader. When owner and president Tom Hall and his daughter Allison first showed me the Nitro Fire system, I was immediately impressed that it is not only more convenient than conventional muzzleloaders, but it is safer. The ability to quickly remove the powder charge is a big deal, such as when crossing a fence, climbing into or out of a tree stand, transporting your rifle in a truck or an ATV, or when hiking rough hills, wading creeks, or plunging through swamps. I've used the Nitro Fire on numerous deer and deer hunting TV hunts over the past two years, and I find it safe, accurate, and very dependable. The gun is available in numerous configurations. To learn more, visit traditionsfirearms.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Apex Outdoor Rewards. Hit record and win rewards. Enter the Apex Whitetail Challenge in your state for your opportunity to win big cash. Enter today and get a 4K camera absolutely free. That's a $300 value absolutely free. There are some serious rewards here, guys, so be sure to enter in your state. Who would have thought 
your next buck could be putting money in your pocket. Reserve your spot today at apexoutdoorrewards.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Full Range Mounting Systems. These mounting systems are a great way to manage all of your mounts in a stylish and organized manner. We are using their pedestal mount here on the podcast set for two shoulder mounts and it looks just awesome. Be sure to check out all their mounting solutions at fullrangesystems.com. And finally, Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Hey, if you've watched me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, you know that I'm an equal opportunity bow hunter. And for most of the past decade, that has also included crossbows. In fact, I shot my first crossbow deer with a 10 point over 12 years ago. And to say that I've been impressed with their technology is an understatement. This year, I'm shooting the new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. It is light, compact, and includes the revolutionary AccuSlide cocking and decocking technology. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.